In Alzheimer's, you'll see fragments of things that are still there from the past and other things that are being lost. You don't know, you have it, you just disappear. If she couldn't talk, she couldn't feed herself, she didn't care for herself at all. I don't want to end up like our mother did. Keck School of Medicine has one of the largest neuroscience programs dedicated to Alzheimer's disease. The pace of discovery is quickening. We have so many more tools. So good morning, Ms. Palmer. Um, my name is Liz, and I'll be working with you um, this morning. I have a PET scan um, actually about once a year, and a PET in an MRI. Part of our main research efforts uh, at USC and in the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center are to look and examine uh, people who are at increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. We are all contributing hundreds of people every, every year and we can build up a database of 40,000 people so that no single researcher could do that. But now you have all these individuals whose memory is characterized over time. So I'm going to read you a little story, just of a few lines. But these tests are the real deal. We are measuring your real practical intellectual function. Participants in are followed over the very long term with regular testing, tests like amyloid PET scans, like PAL PET scans, with blood tests for biomarkers. It would give us clues to the presence of the illness. Now, in the last uh, two years, the FDA has approved a, a, a blood biomarker for amyloid. The advances in biomarkers are not only improving a diagnosis, but opening up a whole new time window for intervention before there's even symptoms. Why don't you uh, cross your arms, okay, and I want you to stand up from that chair. We've been studying a cohort of people that have a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease. It's rare, luckily, but uh, devastating young onset form of Alzheimer's. Probably accounts for about 1% of cases. Now put your feet together. Okay, put your arms up like this. Uh, my mom has early onset and she was diagnosed at 50, in her early 50s. I'm, I'm turning 45 tomorrow. So now we've seen over 100 different families with the same mutation. It's clear what's going on is a so-called founder effect. That is, that all these families are descendants of one person uh, who had had this mutation uh, perhaps well, 100, 200 years ago, um, and now they've dispersed uh, geographically. My birthday. So every year, my mom, she used to write me a letter the first time I did not receive that letter, it was so painful. This is an extreme form of the illness, and some of what we're learning may not apply to late onset Alzheimer's, but I think much of it clearly does. My understanding is you're the first lab to be able to make these measurements. You know, typically you go to your doctor and you, the doctor orders a lipid profile. They tell you, you have LDL cholesterol, you have HDL cholesterol, and based on these measurements, they make decisions. So we've known since the 60s that these measurements of lipoproteins have meaningful implications to heart disease and to longevity in general. But we little know what's happening in the brain compartment. You know, we have a collaborator at UCSF, Dr. Ron Krauss, who's developed this very fancy tool to measure HDL particles at a nanoscale in plasma. So we took this one step further and measured cerebrospinal fluid from patients with and without Alzheimer's, with and without ApoE4, and we found out that those people with more small HDL particles are doing better on cognitive testing. We think it's important because we've identified a target for drugs. Can we develop a drug that can increase small HDL particles? The path is clear here. Today's research is tomorrow's practice of medicine. Thanks for coming in, Dr. Burgoyne. Yes. So what, what did you notice memory-wise? Can, can I tell, tell how, um, I've forgotten, see, that's what happens to me. I forgot what I was gonna do. Some of my colleagues will say when 
um, a family is going through a difficult situation, um, our role should be to listen enough so that we can touch the pain. It's, it's a completely different experience when it's your dad. And, you know, it, it isn't personal, it isn't like, oh, I'm losing my dad. It's just watching him go through it is tough. Basic science, we're trying to understand the basic mechanisms, and that's essential. We have to carry it all the way to the person who has the, the disease. But then a few years ago, I decided that instead of crying, I started writing her a letter myself. So every birthday, I go and write a letter about how great of a mom and the things I remember. When we have such a formidable task, uh, a complex disease that affects so many, many are drawn to this big challenge. Tonight, I'll be writing my letter because tomorrow, that's what I'm gonna do for my birthday.